Hi there everyone, Redbeard here, back at it again, and today I'm going to be reading the Malachi blog. I'm going to talk about the Elspeth blog, because last week I wasn't really able to make any videos. I was quite sick, um, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, on the mend, though, so I want to catch up a little bit after I read the Malachi blog, and just, just generally watching all of the um, partner program people. Uh, make their streams and whatnot, you know, and the thoughts I've seen on uh, on everything I've seen. So, anyways, uh, greetings. This week we're delving into the final legendary lore to arrive in Thrones of Decay. For doing otherwise would end up with each and every one of our names in the Damas Crown. The dwarfs are taking grand engineering to the next level, and with the caliber of mighty machines this guy builds, you'd be wise not to find yourself in the Great Book of Grudges. Introducing Malachi McKyson. This technologically savvy legendary lord, Malachi McKyson, was once a member of the Engineers Guild wherein he built the ironclad Unsinkable, which sank in the airship Indestructible, which blew up, as a result of these errors costing many a dwarf in life. In the process, McKyson was ejected with great shame and took the Slayer's Oath in turn. At a glance, here's what he brings to the dwarves. He's a Slayer. As a Slayer, Malachi is unbreakable whilst also benefiting from all the advantages that Slayers bring to the table. Uh, Battlefield. Engineer. As an Engineer, Malachi supports missile units with an array of abilities and increased capabilities to wreak havoc and doom on the enemy. The Spirit of Grugni enables recruitment for Malachi's forces, supporting infrastructure and the ability to call in support during the battle from the famed airship itself. Malachi's adventures, by completing preparations and improving different war machines and artillery, Malachi can push the feats of his engineering prowess in epic battles and earn valuable upgrades for the spirit of Grogni. Despite his reputation, Mackaysen continued to invent, tinker, and create new tools of the trade after his exit, taking another crack at an airship with the much more successful spirit of Grogni, as well as the vicious goblin humor and axe-flinging war machine. In battle, Malachi McKyson serves the dwarfs as a ranged support lord, tossing explosives toward the enemy with the Cinder Blast Cluster Bomb, blasting them to bits with his triple bar ro barreled repeater, and if those pesky greenskins get too close for dwarf and comfort, smacking them in the face with a massive spanner. He can also reduce the reload time of artillery, increase their accuracy with their with the artillery master passive. Plus, he's come prepared with some special firepower in the form of deranged munition skill. With it, he can target a specific allied missile unit to increase their missile strength and imbue them with magical attacks. But that's not all. With the eyes of Grugni item, Mykaisen emits an area of effect buff to nearby allied allies, increasing their missile damage and range. And Mykaisen knows the importance of good war machine maintenance, so with the Mykaisen's Persuader item, he can keep any more machine topped up with replenish and ammunition and single target heal effect. Beyond battle, Malachi McKyson has other goals in mind to push forward both his oath as a slayer and history as an inventor. This is his adventure. Malachi's Adventures. Slayers often seek a glorious death in battle, whether it be against the strongest of beasts and monsters or in the fiercest of battles. They feel it will absolve them of their sins. Malachi McKyson is one such slayer, but he's not satisfied with death without innovation, and thus his engineering ways rear their head in Malachi's adventures. As an engineer, McKyson uses this opportunity to upgrade his arsenal for use in these battles, fulfilling his oaths along the way. Upon learning of a legendary foe somewhere on the known world, McKyson prepares himself for battle and won't begin until the enemy is aptly researched through a series of smaller conflicts, and his arsenal has the right tools for the job. Perhaps he hears tales of the Greenskins on the hunt to track down a fearsome creature, the discovery and destruction of which would bring in great glory to Malachi and Tyson. But with dwarf and scouts tracking the Greenskins growing crusade, the dwarves must be ready for war. As they begin work on the Goblin Hewer, tearing across the region and enhancing the War Machine's strength, with the spoils of battle. If the dwarves are successful in defeating the legendary battle, McKyson is rewarded with something new, something to bolster the abilities of his greatest creation ever. 
The spirit of Gragne, first used to evade the Skaven forces that struck Wissenland in mass. This flying fortress of ferocity is the peak of Dwarven engineering, and yet Malachi McKyson wants to push this masterful creation further. By achieving victory in his adventures, as explained above, McKyson can improve the spirit of Gragne with valuable upgrades to the famed airship. The spirit of Gragne can support McKyson's forces in a wide area on the campaign map, quickly ferrying supplies of forces around the known world. It grants him access to snappy recruitment, infrastructural support, and may be called into battle itself to support the war effort down below. This one's built to last. So, quick pause to discuss uh, Malachi and all his unique mechanics, and I'm going to take a sip of coffee because I'm going to be talking quite a bit and need to keep my voice spry. Wet the whistle, so to speak. Anywho, so, um, Malachi, you know, now that he's the legendary lord, I'm very happy, you know. I, I predicted Grim Berlickson and Joseph Bugman being legendary lords, and I've alluded to uh, the Norse dwarves, Thorgard Cromson being a good third uh, uh, legendary lord to cap out the dwarves at eight legendary lords, right? Um, now that Malachi is the legendary lord, you know, you, I hate to say it, but you kind of get the best of both worlds with um, or all three of these worlds. You know, you get the Crocodrock start, you get uh, engineer units, and you get a pseudo horde. So, you know, it's enough to hold me over. I definitely think we need eight, you know, for all the base game races for games one and two. We need eight legendary lords. Um, they're popular enough races, they deserve it. Um, so, f you know, going on from here, you know, maybe we get Joseph Bugman and Grim Berlickson as the legendary lords. You know, maybe them <laughs> putting. Malachi, his start position as Krakadrak is their way of saying we're not considering doing Norse Dwarves. Um, having a mammoth with a bull thrower would be friggin' awesome. You know, maybe we could just give that to Malachi's faction, though, since he starts in Krakadrak and he's an engineer. Um, that's an idea. But anyway, I don't want to hang too much on that. Um, he looks really good in battle with his triple barrel shotgun. Looks like he's going to be a blast. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, his items sound really good. The adventures mechanic, honestly, I think modders could um, give these like quest battles like this to any legendary lord they want, really. Uh, you know, with the system in the game. And you get, you know, unique items and units as rewards. Because there's um, mercenaries that you can get as um, for like starting each one of these quests, which are just like insta recruit units, which is cool. Um, the spirit of Grugni. Uh, so yeah, a pseudo horde like the Vampire Coast. You know, there are definitely more lords that could get that in the game. Um, this one is really cool, and he doesn't uh, travel using the underways. He goes over mountains, so uh, you know, like he could he could access the inner ring of Althorn by flying over the mountains, presumably. Um, so you know, lots of cool stuff there. Lots of cool stuff. Um, moving on, Garagrim Iron Fist. Um, Unexpected as a legendary hero, but honestly, he's a Doomseeker legendary hero, and that is awesome. Um, the one and only son to Ungrim Iron Fist of Slayer King Fame is the war mourner of Karakadrin and has achieved legendary hero status. By embracing the life of a slayer and leaving behind his father's courtroom of the Shrine of Grimnir, Garagrim took on the role of war mourner, serving in the king's stead during battle and accepting that great honor as his own. As a slayer is often wont to do, Garagrim awaits his demise at the hands of a worthy foe and seeks to tend to the shrine of Grimnir until that day comes. 
In battle, Garagrim Iron Fist is an anti-infantry powerhouse built to tear down large groups of enemies with his axes of Kadrin. Rune etched weapons that are chained to his wrists so that he never misplaces them. He grants passive weapon strength and magical attacks to his nearby allies with the War Mourner, can spin on the spot with his chained axes to deal a circle of damage thanks to Hurricane of Death, which all Doom Seekers get, uh, gains a ward save that grows in intensity with wards of Grimnir, and enters a melee attack on weapon strength boosted state. Right? And enters a melee attack on weapon strength boosted state. The more he kills as a slayer of legend. The honor's all his. Um, yeah. He's a great addition. Uh, slayers of demons and dragons. To keep the battles flowing on all fronts. Oh, well, let me, let me, real, real quick. Um, for, so for legendary heroes, I, I honestly you think you can make Grim Burlickson a legendary hero at this point. Um, but I also have stated Crag the Grim would be like a croak or aerial level hero. Um, and I think he would be a great legendary hero for sure. Just like a uber rune smith slash priest. Uh, but yeah, those are the two legendary heroes I think come to my mind most that are missing for uh, dwarves. Which, by the way, the, the, the dwarf rework here looks freaking amazing. Well, let's just say that real quick. It, uh, you know, hopefully this is the last real rework. I still think we are missing dwarf content, but this feels like, yeah, the dwarves don't need a rework after this. But we'll see. I'll reserve judgment till the, this comes out, obviously. So, Slayers of Demons and Dragons. To keep the battles flowing on all fronts, McKyson recruits a new lord and hero to bolster the Dwarfen Empire. The Demon Slayer, a new generic lord for the dwarves, smashed through countless trolls, giants, and dragons to the point where, in the present, it's just old hat for him. Having felled so many beasts in the past, the Demon Slayer commits to taking down the mightiest foes of all, the Demons of Chaos. With a loose grip on sanity, the Demon Slayer is a frightening leader, driven mad by his own shameful curse of continued survival against all odds. As a melee specialist lord, the Slayer excels at a bona fide as a bona fide demon killer, dealing magical damage intrinsically and buffing nearby slayers as their leader. With the active ability A Glorious Death, this lord triggers an effect that makes both himself and slayers around him unkillable for a short time. When at last he is beset by a true warrior, the passive ability A Worthy Foe grants him increased melee attack and weapon strength when fighting an enemy that inflicts terror. Um, so real, real quick, right out the bat, they gave um, the Lord the dual axe as an anti-infantry and gave the hero the great axe an anti-large. I thought it would be the other way around, but it, you know, semantics, I suppose. Um, the Dragon Slayer, a new generic hero for the dwarves, is a rarity in and of itself, often traveling alone and shedding all contact with their fellow dwarves. The Slayer of Dragons searches far and wide for their farther breathing of beasts, ready to bring about their end. As a melee specialist hero, the Dragon Killer of the Dwarves is built for felling large entities, is resistant to flaming attacks, and like the Demon Slayer, is searching for a worthy foe to destroy. A mighty doom awaits. Doom Seekers. So, on, on to units. Let me get a <coughs> quick sip. <sighs> still, still recouping from my blessings of Dergal last week. Doom Seekers are the lone wolves of the dwarf army. With magic-resistant wards tattooed all over their body for protection, their unhinged minds are made dangerous by the axes attached to chains as their weapon of choice, like Garagrim Iron Fist before them, for some serious damage. For with, er, with Whirlwind of Death, the Doomseeker spins around on the spot to create a dwarfen vortex of pain, dealing major damage to enemies within range as it blends them into chunks, and they serve as a fine addition to any army looking to bring the wards of Grimnir to the front lines, boosting their ward save as more blood is spilled. Even the Slayers are known to keep their distance from these Seekers of Doom. So yeah, they look amazing. They're at, a, I think, a 32 entity count. 
So they act a little closer to say like uh, aspiring champions than you know a, a true infantry unit, more of a, a champion unit. <clears throat> Slayer Pirates, Dwarf and Sea Slayers, often known as the Slayer Pirates, were once traitors turned to piracy on the Seven Seas after the misplacement of some rare dwarf in Ale, an event so harrowing that even the most strong-willed dwarf would crumble at the mere thought of it. They now take the moniker of mercenaries, searching for long-lost loot and returning it to their rightful owners. For the right price, of course. With a cutlass in one hand and a pistol in the other, the Slayer Pirates are a textbook missile infantry unit for the dwarves, festooned with firearms to keep the forces of evil at bay. And as for those few lucky ROR Slayer Pirates that have found some of their lost dwarf rum, they may come to find that the enemy's melee attacks don't hit quite as hard as they used to drink responsibly. Um, Dwarfin Slayer Pirates, they're amazing. Amazing. Um, quick note, I've heard that they are not available to uh, Aranes Assault Spite just yet, but definitely should be added to her, as she is uh, the Pirate Queen. Uh, but uh, a quick note, uh, just stopping for a second to talk about Slayers. I've also heard that Ungram Iron Fist campaign is amazing now. Um, I can't wait to give him a shot. Um, but yeah, I just want to say that. <laughs> Grudge Raker Thunders. Um, with these Chaos Dwarfs in town, bringing their blunderbusses <laughs> and fearsome artillery to the battlefield, the Thunders that... Hello, Dwarf Commanders may be familiar with are adapting and have gotten their hands on some new firearms with the Grudge Rakers. This is how I suggested that they uh, interpret uh, Grudge Rakers as just as a Thunderer variant. And, you know, that's what, that's what they went with too, so. This double-barreled shotgun prototype by the young master engineer Grim Burlickson. Ooh, a mention! A mention of Grim Burlickson! Uh, it doesn't mean we're getting him, but at least, <laughs> you know, saying, hey, we've heard you, community, about Grim Berlickson. We've not heard, you know, we understand. Anyways, can fire a um, swath of shot into incoming troops and decimate a single targets with one trigger pull. I have, you know, very much like the Chaos Dwarf blunderbusses, I imagine. The close-range infantry squadrons of Great Grudge Rigger Thunderers weren't content with just a fancy new weapon, though, as they also keep their one-handed axe close by for when ammo runs dry, with a shield on their back to let them hold the front lines with ease. Give them both barrels. Epic. Goblin Hewers, the creations of Malachi McIsen, have something of a reputation to them, whether it be the masterful spirit of Gragni or the infamous Goblin Hewer. This war machine terrifies any that stand before it as it flings axes across the battlefield with lethality, speed, and a touch of precision. What the Goblin Hewer lacks in range, it makes up for in its ability to shred nearby targets, serving as a burst damage artillery unit for the dwarves when up close and personal. As if the enemies of the dwarves were mere stalks of wheat, standing between them in victory, the Goblin Hewer sides its way through the front line, separating skin from bone with its sharp projectiles and complex design of wheels, chains, and gears. Manned by slayers, once the Goblin Hewer has expended all its ammunition, the crew charge headlong into battle to keep the blood flowing. Time to reap what you sow. So on that ammunition, um, the early showings showed two ammo for this uh, unit of Goblin Hewers, which um, immediately threw up red flags to me because it's supposed to spit like a machine gun. Now, what I didn't know at the time is each ammunition is a huge volley of axes. Um, that being said, two is very small for a unit that that is their whole gig. That is why you buy them. Yeah, sure, if they run out of ammo, they have some slayers, but that's that's not how you want to use the unit, you know. The, the slayers are just there to defend the artillery piece, really. And man it, move it around. 
but the real, you know. So, uh, but they've bumped the ammunition up to four, I've seen, which is better. I still don't think that's enough. I, I granted, you know, there's more abilities to restore ammunition now in the door froster with this update. We already had the master engineer, but still, four seems very small. I get it's a huge, huge damage per volley, but um, I, I, really, I hope they bump it up to at least six. Um, but I digress. Let's move on to the Thunderbards. Let me take a quick sip. It's not just any old port in a storm with the latest heavy centerpiece unit for the dwarves. The one-of-a-kind Thunder Barge. This airborne warship is bolstered by <clears throat> bomb racks, cannons, and Grudge Raker riders, serving as a flying fortress to carry overwhelming amounts of firepower to the front lines, as well as a handy beer hall to keep the pilots inebriated enough to consider flying such a dangerous contraption. The opposing forces will prioritize taking this thing down before it gets too close, but they're going to struggle as a special mix of Bugman's Ale is ignited aboard the vessel, triggering Thunder Burner, an ability that slowly tears the Thunder Barge apart in exchange for reaching some incredible speeds. Once within range, the Spear of Grudney can be launched, hurling a giant harpoon into the enemy. Embrace imperfection in active oblivion. So yeah, as we've as, as we've seen, there's a new gunship rule for units, which I think the uh, Marienburg landship has as well. I don't know if any other units, like the steam tanks, were given this. I am not totally sure. The Thunder Barge definitely has it, <coughs> where you don't really fire any of the weapons. I think you can move. You have full control of the movement, but it fires all of its weapons by itself, from what I understand. Um, except for the giant spear that comes out of the blimp. Um, but yeah. And, oh, the, the Spirit of Grogne, uh, Malachi's unique Thunder Barge, has, is crewed by Slayers instead, which is a nice, say, uh, it's just a nice detail. Anyways, moving on to Dwarf Legacy updates. To wrap up our deep dive into the Dwarves editions in Thrones of Decay and Update 5.0, we're going to look at the primary legacy updates that you can expect, just as if we did with Nurgle and the Empire before them. And just like those two races, the content mentioned below will be completely free to anyone that owns the Dwarves in one form or another. Let go. <laughs> the Great Book of Grudges. What are the issues with the current system? Not to be confused with the YouTube content creator. Uh, grudges aren't as rewarding as they could be in the current system, and thus engaging with it may not always be the best course of action. Making it feel less important overall, plus grudges often push you into doing things you are already do going to do, rather than encouraging you to make actual tactful decisions. The grudges being a series of missions also felt like an underutilization of the mechanic and the features usage on the campaign map needed some more work. Grudges were not as urgent as we'd have liked either. A big part of the dwarves' power fantasy is having to right the many wrongs surrounding you, which didn't quite land with the original system. Another issue was that you could sometimes get stuck with grudge missions you couldn't complete, which would unfairly tank your severity bar. So, what are we changing? Um, grudges will now be present and fully visible on the campaign map. Any faction that performs a hostile action against the dwarf culture earns grudges. As a dwarf player attacking an enemy, an army, or settlement that has grudges associated with it will award you with that grudge value upon victory. We're introducing a new system. Ages of Reckoning. Every ten turns, the dwarves will have a target number of grudges that must be resolved, and the percentage of those grudges that have been taken care of at the time of the Reckoning will correspond with certain rewards. Clearing a high number of grudges will result in buffs, new grudge settler units, and even a temporary grudge settler army at the highest ranks, but low performance during age will come with penalties. Um, so, yeah, new unit types, kind of like the Amber system, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, the Amethyst Armory, rather. Not the Amber system, Amethyst Armory from Elspeth. Um... But yeah, legendary grudges are also available in our grand missions that benefit the entire dwarf culture when resolved. For example, taking the 
Fight to Skaven Blight and the Hellpit reward, reward you with unique army ability to summon dwarf miners in your own territory now that they're no longer under the threat of Skaven attack. Or you may also attempt to rebuild the Karazenkor, unlocking the Underway Travel Network, which allows fast travel between Karaks. So they've baked what I talked about in my Joseph Bachman video, with reworking holds and undercities into the grudges system, which is perhaps not as in-depth as I would have liked, but I think is a, is a happy middle ground, I suppose. Uh, and just making everything of more about the group, the Book of Grudges with this Age of Reckoning system as well, I think is a really great thing. Um, I'm very, very happy with the dwarf rework and everything I'm seeing so far. I, again, I haven't gotten my hands on it personally. Um, confederations can be earned by outgrudging your fellow legendary lords. After exceeding the amount of grudges another lord has earned, plus an additional amount, you can confederate the other factions via the Book of Grudges panel. So now we have um, a, a Pokemon system, basically. You know, we, we've seen it with the Beastmen, with Bretonia, uh, Warriors of Chaos, Norska Greenskins, you know, some type of confederation system. Um, uh, and I'm happy to see the dwarves getting it. You know, I kind of hope at one point that all... Uh, oh, and uh, the Empire, particularly Carl of France, has it too. But I, I hope that all races at one point will be able to have at least one lord. Like their race leader or something. Like Malekith or Tyrion. Have some sort of mechanic where they can confederate other lords. Seeing that added to more lords is nice. And races. We feel that this new system for the Great Book of Grudges expands upon the fantasy you expect to have when playing as the dwarves, offers a re reliable confederation of your fellow legendary lords, and makes for a much more interactive, rewarding experience as you write all those wrongs. I totally agree. Looks uh, for what I've seen. Technology tree. What are the issues with the current system? The original technology <laughs> tree for the dwarves. This is my complaint. Was the uh, for the dwarves is massive. So much that it can be tricky to keep track of and engage with. Yeah, the whole, it was one, on one screen, tons of tech on one screen, just a mess to look at. Um, what are we changing? Not wanting to remove tech from the doors, we now split the original, and this was my suggestion too, uh, once I saw the chaos doors. Split the original tree into two tabs with a guilds tab and a clans tab respectively, and we've done a full sweep on all effects. Awesome. Building chains. What are we changing? We're making some tweaks to the dwarfs building change chains. One key example of which is the level 5 building, the Traders Guild Hall, which will grant Oath Gold every turn. Oath Gold was, before the change, is quite tricky to play around. Agreed. You often had far too little. Agreed. Or on the other end, more than you could ever need. Yep. This change sh should help alleviate that stressor. Yeah, so it looks like Oath Gold is much more plentiful now in, um, once you start getting it, like you don't get it right out of the gate, but once you start getting it, there's lots more ways to use it, but there's also more oath gold. Um, like before, you know, if anything gave you oath gold, it was like plus one per turn. Now it's more like plus 10 or plus 50 per turn. Um, so the forge, what are we changing? We've had a look at the forge items and done a full polish pass to make them advance in smaller increments and so that you won't always need a specific reef source to forge certain items. Um, interesting. Uh, it's a smaller change than those mentioned prior, but giving the system a light polish nicely adds to the overall improvements made to the dwarves with this update. Yep, yeah, great. Up next, for more details on Malachi McKyson to see this deranged de genius in action, keep an eye on our official channels for the final showcase. We'll be back later this week to delve into some of the additional free content arriving with Update 5.0, including a free legendary lord, Epidemius, that absolutely no one has <laughs> already figured out yet, uh, as well as the introduction of the Nemesis ground. Glad they're poking fun at themselves a little bit there. That's funny. And as always, you can expect a full suite of patch notes for update 5.0 the day prior to launch, and you can reach us uh, about all things Total War in the CA community forums, or the official Total War Discord server, seen on the battlefield, Total War team. Um, Epidemius, I'm, I'm warming up to. 
You know, he, he, he this campaign does look good. I definitely was on the he should be a legendary hero train prior, but uh, you know, I have warmed up to it. You know, now I think you know we should just get all the heralds as legendary lords. Probably like you know, we got the changeling, we got Epidemius, and then we need the mask for Slanesh and uh, Azul Skull Tiger for Corn. Uh, and then the Nemesis Crown. Oh, and also Epidemius looks like he he really does buff demons up a lot. And, you know, there's the difference of, like, you know, Kugatsri work makes him have really strong plagues. Blessed plagues, they're called. And Epidemius has more, you know, it, it's quality versus quantity. Epidemius just, like, he has a bar at the top where the more plagues that you've infected the world with that are active, um, the, the stronger he, him and his armies get, which is a very cool mechanic. And he looks he looks like he actually makes plague bears and plague drones good. So that's good. <laughs> they need that. Uh, and then the Nemesis crown, you know, getting another Sword of Cain type item is amazing. Hopefully one day we can get a Far East item, because that would just complete you know, it, it feel wrong if, you know, the game one, we had a, you know, game one, basically, legendary item in the Nemesis Crown, and then a Sword of Cain for the game two, but never got, like, a proper game three, like a Far East item, like a Cathayan item, or an Int, or Koresh, you know, an item from one of those lands, um, makes, we, 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 should, we should definitely get that at some point. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to Elspeth. And again, I'm not going to read everything because I'm sure those of you who already would care for that have already read it or heard another YouTuber talk about it. So I'm um, just going to go kind of bit by bit and give some thoughts. So Elspeth on Draken looks like she's going to be OP. And I, <laughs> I love in the best of ways. Um... She's a spellcaster, so she should be basically the best deathcaster in the game, or at least top three, but I've probably number one. Um, for mounts, she gets, and she's got like a unique, like purple suns. I saw this one, um, I think it was in the showcase, where she had all these little purple suns sprouting up around her, which looked crazy. Mounts, she gets a warhorse. And she gets the monstrous Carmine Dragon, which does have animations where it shoots a freaking laser. <laughs> which looks amazing. Um, it's less ethereal than I would have liked. Her Dark Walker ability like, gives her physical resistance and strider, which strider on a dragon doesn't seem super important. Like any flying unit doesn't seem super important. But um, I was hoping that like when the ability was active that Elspeth and the dragon straight up become ethereal. Like, they, they, by appearance, the aesthetic would be, like, kind of this black fog or mist. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I, I wish it tailored a little bit more into the actual lore of what Dark Walker means, where, you know, her and the dragon can literally become mist, basically. Um, but Imperial Gunnery School is a unique campaign mechanic where you combine black powder and wizardry, essentially. Basically, it's a, a Ica Claw reskin, but I think that's amazing. Ica Claw's mechanic is amazing, so. Gardens of Moor is a new building type, and it looks like you can only build five of them at a time. And I don't know if that's specific, like you can't, you can only build it in the Empire, because she's very much built to be like a defender of the Empire, which, you know, her starting in Nuln actually makes sense the way uh, Carl and her work now. I'm not going to talk more about Carl. Um, but yeah. But so between these buildings, uh, these gardens of more, you can 
Insta Travel, which is so you can be at anywhere that needs help in the Empire. Um, this mechanic is awesome, having more loreful ways to teleport in such a big map. I think is great. You know, I don't think every lord, every race necessarily needs it, but for those that there's a mechanic there that makes sense because lorefully Elspeth does teleport. Anyways, so going on to Theodore Bruckner. Theodore Bruckner looks amazing. Um, I don't think he's quite as big as he is lorefully, like the mountain of Game of Thrones. Um, he gets his demogriff mount. I don't know if they... I don't think they mentioned the name. His demogriff is named Reaper and is the largest demogriff in the world. Because it's got to hold like the one of the biggest men in the world. <laughs> um, but yeah, Hand of Judgment. He's a really good duelist and he's got an, the ability to like death explode with the Bale Flame Amulet. Um, and the Liar's Bane and Storm. He gets both the weapons. And if he's dismounted, he doesn't have the helm. If he's mounted, he has his helm on. There's a lot of cool details with Theodore Bruckner. Um, great addition as a legendary hero. I Personally, I would have liked if he was a personal champion to Elspeth von Draken, which essentially is a legendary hero, but it's not for the whole race. And that we got Jubal Falk as the legendary hero for the whole race. But I digress. Um, I'm sure modders will fix. Hashtag. <laughs> um, Master Engineer. So in the trailer, Master Engineer had a sniper rifle. He does have guns on his back, but it's very much explained that he uses a grenade launcher. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, and then the engineer has the, the hero has the repeater rifle, so he also doesn't have the sniper rifle, but has Mercurial Shot, which is a sniper rifle missile. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they like the Master Engineer and the Dwarves can get like a suite of weapons that are like loadouts they can change between. It's not totally clear. Um, pigeon bombs are amazing. <laughs> so it's like a bombardment of pigeon bombs. It's pretty awesome. Um, we get the mechanical steed, which is oh, so cool. And they did a real good job on the model. It looks like the tabletop. Um, and, and engineers also get steam tank mounts. It's oh, very many exciting things. On the other hand, so starting with units, Nuln Ironsides in the trailer very much had the repeater volley guns. Which is something I suggested in my um, Gunpowder and Sorcery video. Which is speculation some months ago or something. But, um, and, but now we've seen that the repeaters that the Outriders use now work as repeater volley guns. So they spray a bunch of little bullets. Um, and this is, this is just another modders please fix thing. Technically, lorefully, null and iron sides. Uh, you might guys hear a plane in the background, but uh, I'm just going to keep going. Null and iron sides, lorefully, do have these long rifles, sort of similar to Hawkland long rifles, but without, like, the scope. And they're just heavily armored and should have charge defense. I don't know if that's it's stated anywhere, whether they have charge defense or not. <coughs> um... But straight up, I think, you know, the way <laughs> CA pivoted, uh, it's got Games Workshop stink all over it. I think they saw the trailer and were like, ooh, no, 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 that's not what Null and Ironsides are. Um, vetoed hard by Games Workshop is very much what it seems like. Um, but yeah, modders, please fix. Give them back the uh, repeater volley guns because I think those will be very cool. To have as an infantry unit. Hawkland Long Rifles look amazing and they do, I was a little confused if they worked like um, reskins of 
crane gunners and Giselles, because they're not a weapons team with the like a what is, is the Pavis shield? I think it's called. Um, it's just one guy. But looking at their stats, they basically look like Giselles and crane gunners, just without the shield. Um, so that's going to be a really neat unit for the Empire. Knights of the Black Rose. Um, I didn't include knights for my speculation of this video, because I think we'll get a Steel and Faith focused Mid Inland DLC at some point, which should very much focus on knights. Knights of the Black Rose is an interesting ad. Like, they're just not a super popular um, or a prominent knightly order per se. But I think it's a great welcome addition. We get a nice melee cavalry, elite melee cavalry. They look sick with their like skull black masks, the anti infantry melee cavalry instead of shock cavalry. And they worship more the good of teeth. Uh, I think they're very cool. Steam tank volley guns. Um, it, it, whether we needed. Uh, a variant of steam tank is I don't know but it's a very cool unit um, I'm sure certainly gonna make a lot of use of it now the steam tanks are open and have an engineer shooting out so there's like three different weapon sets so I think they do have the gunship rule they also have those slits on the those little kind of murder holes on the side of the tank which I think people shoot out of so I assume they have the gunship rule as well but anyways, the volley guns just fire faster at shorter range than the um, regular steam tank. Looks very cool. And engineer mounts, yeah, awesome. Um, Marienburg land ship, the big centerpiece unit. So yeah, it's got um, like an explosive death ability because it's like got a volatile boiler. Um, it's got repeater volley guns. Uh, all around the deck shooting. It's got a big cannon on the front and then it might have some other weapons, I'm not sure. It's gonna be a really fun unit to use, I'm sure. And then looking at the updates to like Elector Counts and Imperial Authority, um, I mean it, it just looks all very good um, without like really getting into it too much. I mean, well, let, let me just read what are we changing. So, Imperial Authority has been reworked and separated from the Elector Count system. While the Elector Count system is often not appropriate for our other Empire Lords as they are, aren't electors in the lore, we felt like Imperial Authority could be used as central mechanic for all Empire factions. All Empire factions now have access to Imperial Authority. However, the feature only becomes active once they own land within the Empire territory. That is so cool that you can like gain a mechanic for being in a certain area of the map. And I think that, uh, you know, that gets me brainstorming on other factions that might be able to use something to that effect. But the Elector Counts mechanic is now exclusive to Carl Friends, but don't worry, Gelt is getting new toys as outlined below. Now, in the future, when we get a Vampire Counts rework, I think a version of the Elector Counts, but you know, like a, a, a corrupted version, uh, should be given to Vlad von Karstein. Uh, and, you know, j just going on that thought of giving, like, you know, because Carl Franz is getting the Elector's Count and uh, Machinations, and Balthazar Gelt is getting the Colleges of Magic. You know, there's... I really think most ba base game lords really should get their own unique mechanics at some point, like Skrull getting Plagues and Queek getting, like, uh, you know, headhunting assassination missions, sort of. Um, who else? I don't know, you know, I could make a whole video about that, but, uh, keeping going on. Imperial Authority would previously impact fealty via chance. Fealty now goes up and down directly via cause and effect, so players will be able to more directly see the effects of their, or others' decisions and actions across the Empire. At a base level, Imperial Authority shows how much of the Empire is actually controlled by said Empire, and it will, um... 
It will divvy out rewards accordingly, whilst giving you a clear view of how well the Empire of Man is doing as a whole. Some tweaks and improvements have been made to the Electric Counts UI to tidy it up, fix the color bleeding, and have some in the Electric Counts visible at all times. New markers have been added to the Empire Regents to show who their rightful owner should be when owned by someone else. Some of the Elector Counts functionality has changed. Originally, it replenished all the Elector Count state troops. Now, when the Elector Counts are summoned, every Elector Count that is not garrisoned or besieged will be summoned to Carl Fran's location, turning the tide when faced with overwhelming odds. So that's like a late game ability, but you can summon every Elector Count to your location to help you out. That is, oh, uh, the Carl Fran changes are so awesome, so awesome. Empire's going to be... I can't wait. I can't... Oh, this is going to... This is... From everything I've seen... And again, I'll reserve judgment till I have it in my hands. But from everything I've seen, this is shaping up to be one of the best DLCs in the trilogy. Definitely the best DLC for Warhammer 3. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm very impressed. They're really turning the tide for themselves, CA. <laughs> Night and day from Shadows of Change, from what I've seen. Um, so with these changes and by allowing every Empire faction to access Imperial Authority, we're reinforcing the idea that every leader is motivated by the protection of the Empire, even if some are preoccupied in other areas at the beginning of a campaign. So, yeah, Carl Friends. Okay, he starts with Helmgard now, which is, I don't really, me being a veteran, I don't really think his start needed to be easier, but I understand that he's one of the recommended starting factions for new players, so. Oh yeah, but his electoral mach machinations can be used, um, you know, like the of the manipulation of other factions, but also <clears throat> basically it's like almost like a changing of the ways mechanic. We, we, you know, they're unique. Each decree is unique, but they look very powerful. Um, look very good. And yeah, Carl's immune to all trespass penalties. That's uh, oh, in, in Empire-owned territory. That's just goes a long way to making him feel like the Emperor. But then now we have Balthazar Gelt, who gets um, Colleges of Magic. Now, I suggested that the Colleges of Magic be a, a system for the whole Empire, similar to Kislev's Ice Court, which, so you can uh, recruit uh, wizard lords and wizard heroes. Now, don't get me wrong, Balthazar Gelt's new mechanic is awesome. So like, each, for each lore of magic, there's three abilities. Um, the first one being, uh, you instantly recruit a wizard of that lore. The second one being a powerful army ability, like, um, oh, what's the one that? Uh, death one, you instantly damage all enemy, um, armies within the within a specific region um life magic instantly heal your army um and there's a bunch of other ones and then the third ability for each lore is i think it, i think it gives a unique legendary item as well as allowing you to use the cataclysm spell from the realms of chaos uh, i really think like for magic heavy characters that we should start bringing in those cataclysm spells more. So like Teclis is a big one that comes to mind. Or Kairos or Marathi, Ilariel, uh, Lord Croak, Mazdamundi, Malagor, mm, Ariel, Fey Enchantress, Archaon even, you know, um, Bellicor. Lords that are very powerful in magic um, should be able to unlock Cataclysm spells. One way. They shouldn't just get them automatically. They should unlock them either through a mechanic or a skill tree or an event or a quest battle or something of that sort. But anyways, 
So for Balthazar Gelt, he starts in cafe now as well. Oh, well, one more note. So his Colleges of Magic has a unique currency called Arcane Essays, which I'm not, you know, you just get those from battles, I think. But yeah, um, so Balthazar Gelt starts in cafe. And I think, oh, the way they did this is so awesome. So you start with like, it's like a buddy mechanic, sort of. So you start with an alliance with Jiao Ming, which lawfully makes sense that they'd be. And, and you know, I suggested that Balthazar Gelt move to Tilia because he's got a lot of lore where he goes to learn, um, you, you know, study some arcane essays there. Um, he also goes to Althuan, and um, but it's very much in the same vein, him going to Cathay to learn more about magic. So, so yeah, but yeah, you get like three campaigns out of this. So you can either help him retake the land and give it back to him and then stay in Cathay and help more, I guess. And there's some powerful buildings there. You get, or you can take the land for yourself and go to war with him making an enemy out of the Cathayans, but also getting some powerful buffs for that. Or my favorite, you go, you give up all your land and go back to the empire. Uh, specifically, I think you land in Altdorf and for 10 turns you have free upkeep, all armies, and you get 25,000 gold and just to help you go settle somewhere else in the Empire. So essentially you have three different campaigns to play with Balthazar Gelt. Now that is chef's kiss amazing. What a great change for Balthazar Gelt. Um, I think we should look at, you know, other, like particularly dual start lords. I think dual start lords should get a rework to this system. Uh, like this system is just better. Um, so, like, uh, talking about, like, Malice Darkblade, um, Teclis, even, uh, Imric, um, you know, you know, Malice would go back to Had Grief, uh, Teclis would go back to Safari, um, Imric would go back to Kalidor, but they could also have a buddy that they could give the land back to, or that they could declare war on and take for themselves for some powerful buffs. So, you can set it. I think that would be so much better for each one of those. Um, there's someone I'm not thinking of, tell me in the comments, but that would be so much better for each of those lords to have, like, basically three campaigns. So much more engaging and rewarding. I love this for Balthazar Gelt. I want to see it reworked for, the, for any of those dual start lords, really. I, I think it's just a better system, by and far. Um... So yeah, um, what else? I think that's pretty much it for that. Um, I, I, I've probably run this video long enough anyways. Oh, gyro bombers got reworked and they're so much more powerful now. They're like, so the gyro bomber got moved from one, a single entity to now it's four entities. The gyro copters were four entities, I think. And now are a dozen entities. And they, from what I've seen, they're way more powerful and actually worth bringing now. Which, ugh, so good. Oh, there's a new Iron Man mode that removes manual saves. So it basically gives an aspect of le playing legendary campaigns without necessarily having to pay legend. It, you know, giving more options to set up your campaign is always a good thing. Um... Oh, and then uh, I guess some some gripes I've had with Nurgle. Um, the Nurgle lore needs a better skin, hands down. You know, make them look more kind of putrid Blight King esque. Um, please. <laughs> you know, yeah, it had to do with the the chaos Lord of Zinch and whatnot. So, please do that for Nurgle as well. And bio trolls. Give them their fucking bio. Three ways you can do that. Three to five bound missiles like every other bio in the game. Uh, 
pretty melee missiles like chameleon stalkers, but with the cooldown maybe instead of ammo. And or just a straight up missile attack with ammo, I suppose. Um, any of those ways would work. How can you put bile trolls in the game without giving them a bile attack? I get that there's like a melee animation, but every troll has that. I demand <laughs> that bile trolls get a bile attack. Modders will fix, obviously, but that should just be a vanilla thing. Um, oh, Gotrek and Felix's rework looks amazing. Also, Macau uh, Malachi starts with them. Which, you know, if you've read... Oh, jeez, what is Dragon Slayer? Yeah. Um, it just oh, it just feels so thematic, getting Gotrek and Felix to start with Malachi. Um, especially when you're up by Krakadrak. Technically, it's supposed to be Dark Doom, but... Um, anyway. They get whole skill lines of their own. Um, Felix heals, Gotrek, lots of army buffs. Um, but then there's a new quest battle to acquire them, which looks amazing. It looks like actually a, a challenge, which I love to see. I love to see. Um, what else? Oh, there's a pseudo-legendary dwarf lord that you get through the grudge mechanic. Um, along with these grudge settler units, which <laughs> spawns a whole army. Oh man, it's so cool. Oh, new skill lines for all the Empire uh, uh, heroes. So witch hunters, wizards, captains. Um, didn't see captains get the demigriff mount like a lot of people were hoping for. I kind of think that it would be nice to give Carl an Imperial Zoo mechanic. Like, you know, it's, it's like a cooldown of every 10 to 15 turns. Um... But when, when, and then you hit a button, and it wouldn't be a complicated mechanic per se, but all it is is you hit a button every like 10 or 15 turns, and for three to five turns, Carl Franz gets the Imperial Dragon, um, and then every lord or hero in his faction gets like a unique exotic animal amount based on the Imperial Zoo of Outdoors. Uh, you know, so captains could get demigriffs. Um, oh, I found it. So, for the Imperial Zoo, you give uh, Carl Franz Imperial Dragon, you give captains, demigriffs, generals, maybe get a, a dragon too, or something. Um, warrior priests could get Pegasus, arch lectors could get griffins, witch hunters could get a barded warhorse. Huntsman generals get barded warhorses, master engineers get Pegasus, engineer gets Pegasus. Um, yeah, Maybe, yeah, you just, you just give like an exotic mount animal for every lord and hero while this button is active. It's like three to five turns and then it goes away. Um, I, you know, Imperial Zoo is a big piece of lore and I think would do well in Carl Friend's faction, but yeah, I'm gonna end there though. Um, Hope you guys enjoyed this. Tell me your thoughts in the comments. And I will see you next time.